I don't know about how many of you know about Daniel. Of course, Daniel's a member of our church. And, uh, you know, I think your first exposure to Seventh-day Adventist Christianity was at Reading Junior Academy, right? Mm -hmm. And you went there one year, yep. and uh, he learned well. And I only went there one year, and then the next year you were back in public school, right? Yep. And then how many years later was it Then you attended the meetings? Seven years. Seven years. Seven years. After the Army. <laughs> after, after he'd been in the Army. Yeah. After, seven years after. So Daniel came to these meetings. You saw a sign out front, was it? Something um, like that. No, I was uh, invited oh, by nice. uh, at a. I was at a martial arts gym, and somebody invited me to a Spanish Adventist, uh, oh. Adventist church. So, are you guys hearing this? And okay. oh, well, <clears throat> so I was uh, around like two or almost three years ago. I was invited. Um, uh, before then, I was like a, a martial art instructor. So I was. Uh, there was a guy training his. Uh, son and he said hey you should i don't train on on saturday and in my head i was thinking hmm, I, only the only people that i know um well he's mentioned he goes to church on saturday and i was like oh you must be seven day adventists and he invited me to his church and so i said you know what it, let me go there i enjoyed my time and i i did like what they were uh sharing and uh i went there uh but there was only just one problem it was in Spanish, so I didn't know <laughs> what they were saying. My, my Spanish is a bit broken, but, um, but I, I, I felt a, like immense peace just being there, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I was like, well, you know, let me go to, uh, there's a church next to the school I went to. And I was like, I'm sure they speak English, hopefully. <laughs> and so I walked through there, and they were speaking English, and it was a, it was a blessing. And from there, I met the the uh, core students there, and uh, we've got, we got, yeah. to, uh, you're getting ahead of me, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, I, I remember talking with Pastor Scott about Daniel, and uh, Daniel would slip in and slip out, you could hardly catch him, and he asked me to try to sit with Daniel, I don't know if I ever actually got that opportunity, but anyways, Daniel, Pastor Scott told me when he talked with Daniel about joining the church, the doctrines, that Daniel said, well, it was just like a review because he'd already heard it all at RJA. So that says a lot about our school system. And since then, Daniel has really been involved in the church. He jumped in with both feet. He's been involved with our youth, and that's an answer to prayer that's been prayed about by our prayer group that meets afterwards. By the way, if you'd like to be in that prayer group, it's open, just go right in after service over here in the, in the multi-purpose room and you know, enjoy the blessing. And that's, that's what's happening in this church. And so Daniel, then he decided to go to the core school of evangelism, which, are, which is a Pennsylvania conference. Uh, school of evangelism teaches young adults how to put their faith into practice in, right, in normal life. Uh, and, he, and then he's been, he came back to the church and he's been even more active with the youth, et cetera. And it's just been, Daniel's been a blessing to us. The Lord is really. Now, <clears throat> the reason he's speaking today, one of the reasons anyways, is that this is his last Sabbath with us for a little while. Because in his zeal for the Lord, he wants to go out to Weimar University, which is an Adventist university, and he's going to learn health principles. He started learning them at CORE, right, Daniel? Mm -hmm. And he's going to get certified, and he wants to do medical missionary work. And Daniel is also good at Bible studies, which is part of the medical missionary work. As we know, we've had a wonderful family join us, the Martes, because of, of uh, Daniel's influence. And so this sermon he'll be preaching will be very special. And now, when you go away to university, you know, you just, you know, reach in your back pocket, pull you out your wallet and pay for it, right? No problem. <laughs> As usually, there, there's expenses there. And so we're not going to take up an offering today. We don't want to set any kind of precedent. But I would encourage you that if you would like to help Daniel in some way, shape, or form, that you would talk to him. And he can tell you how to do that if you're so inclined. 
So if the Holy Spirit moves you to do that, Daniel be in the back here, I'm sure he'll be happy to, to share his uh, contact information, and you can contact him directly, and he, and he can basically share with you how you, can, how you can help him if you'd like. So Daniel, we, we really appreciate your service here at the church, and this is kind of a, a send-off, but I want to make it very, very clear we want you back. <laughs> you might as well come back because this is the best church in North America. So, I mean, why not? So, uh, why don't we pray together, Daniel, before you, before you mm -hmm. open God's word for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Daniel. And we ask your blessing upon him. You know his faith journey from beginning to end. And here we are in one episode, so to speak. We don't know the end from the beginning, but you do. Our prayer is that Daniel will return. But as your son Jesus said, thy will be done. We ask your blessing upon him now as he breaks the bread of life that we would not hear Daniel, but that we would hear you through the Holy Spirit's moving in our hearts. Not only hear you as individuals, but as a church, as a congregation, as brothers and sisters in Christ who love Jesus with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. May it be, sweet Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys hear me is this on all right so i just want to say guys i hope you uh know which uh daniel sean was talking about it wasn't me i wasn't in babylon i wasn't in captivity <laughs> uh, he's talking about the daniel in the bible <laughs> so like uh like will mentioned i am going to weimar university um i know that some folks here they they have been in uh weimar i know chris graduated from that school and uh, there was a family that lived there for uh, close around that area for 25 years. It's a, it's a beautiful area. Um, I'm going to be taking like a program. It's a, it's a, it's a health program. It's like a, a four-month program where you basically learn like a lot of uh, medical missionary um, and uh, a lot of uh, religion and health. And it, it's really exciting to do a, a lot of like firsthand of uh, healthy cooking massage, first aid, uh, hydrotherapy, so much more. Um, I got to be there for like a week and it was beautiful. The students would visit uh, folks that had uh, like some health problems and they would cook like a, a healthy meal for them. Um, and, and not only that, but share them, uh, like do a Bible study. And it, it was amazing. They had a lot of programs, like uh, some that you heard, Diabetes Undone. Um, so it's gonna be a, a blessing there. Um, I just ask that you guys pray for me. It's an intensive program. Um, but it's a, it's a really, really good program. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what will happen in the four, four months, um, either if God calls me to work somewhere around that area, um, but we'll, we'll see wherever the Lord leads. And so <clears throat> today's topic I'm going to be talking about is the, uh, is the slide on? Okay, so the, today's topic is going to be about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the role it plays in our uh, Christian experience. And so the title is, as, Are We in This Thing Alone? And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, God has made provision for us to succeed the Christian experience. So the best decision we can ever make is giving our life or recommitting our life to Jesus. But after making this decision, 
there can be this feeling of pressure and the weight of an expectation that we are supposed to be someone different than we were before we made that decision. And that can be quite scary. If we are, we are not careful, the stress and the baggage, well, we can bring them to our spiritual life. And how? Because the life God wants us uh, to have could be very difficult to achieve. And so because we aren't perfect, we fall short. We end up saying things when, usually when we mess up, like, I got to try harder. Um, why did I even do this? Why did I pick up this cigarette? Or why did I, I knew I wasn't supposed to do this. God is upset with me. And this can be even more stressful than before. And uh, now we really end up thinking, wow, I'm, I'm really a, alone in this journey. And so how do I become what God intends for me to be? Am I in this thing alone? You know, Jesus said, I leave with you peace and give you peace, right? So how can we enjoy our Christian life? And through that, we'll learn it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray and then we'll we'll continue. I'm going to bow down and just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. We're we're just uh, glad that we can all be here. Father, I just pray that uh, this message, that I'm not heard, but you are heard, Lord, that um, it glorifies you and that the congregation learned a lot from just the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we're just thankful that you gave us this gift. Um, so, Father, I just pray that you speak through me. Um, and please be with each and one of us and, and bless those that are not here but watching it online. And those who also couldn't make it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. put this here. So, we're going to look at the three primary roles of the Holy Spirit in our life and what God is doing for his people throughout salvation history. So, the three roles we're going to look at is convict, confirm, and conform. Those are, those are the three main things that the, the Holy Spirit does. To convict us from right to wrong, or from wrong, wrong to right, that there is a God and that we need God in our life to confirm that we are a child of God and that we are to inherit the kingdom of God as heir and to conform our life to teach us how to live a life that God has for us. And so we're going to go over each of them, um, each of these roles in, in, in more depth. So con- convict. So we're starting with the first role of the Holy Spirit is convict. So have you ever felt that you did something wrong and it made you feel bad, and you wanted to do something right. You weren't satisfied with that choice you made. Now you feel guilty. Well, that is the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin. Um, and there's something interesting that, that every good deeds that, that, you, um, that you did was not on your own accord, but it was by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. For example... Like they say you see somebody stuck in a highway and they, they pull to the side and everybody's driving by, they're minding their own business, they got a place to go. Um, however, there's that one person that pulls to the side um, just to help that guy. You know, he got somewhere to be and, and he just sacrifices his time to help that individual. Well, that is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You see, we don't do, um, uh, we don't do none of, uh, of our good works on our own. Everything good comes out of the Spirit of God. You know, and so let's look at our first verse here, uh, John 16, 6, 11. But because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send them to you. I know, for me, I'd be sad if Jesus has to go. I'm here with Jesus for three years, and he has to go. I'm like, what? No. But continuing in verse 8, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you see me no more. Um, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. So according to verse 8, who is the object of the spirit work? The world. The spirit was just not reserved for religious people. Amen for that. 
Um, this is the first work of the Holy Spirit to convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. Have you ever had someone, something convict you in your life? That sense of conviction is the product of the Holy Spirit working upon your heart. According to verse 9, why does the Holy Spirit convict of sin? Because of unbelief. Because they do not believe in Christ. That sense of conviction is not just to make me feel bad. According to this verse, it's to lead me to Christ. This is the really good news. When, I'm, when I am feeling guilty, the Spirit convicts me of that so that I will believe in Jesus the very one who died to forgive me and all of my wrongdoing. So instead of running away from conviction, what I need to do is run to Jesus. And so according to verse 10, why does the Spirit convict of righteousness? Well, because Jesus is going to the Father and the disciple will see him no more. He was the living and breathing example of what right living looks like. And he's going to heaven and now that example will, will be there no longer. Now the Spirit will convict them of righteousness in his absence. So why does the Spirit uh, convict of judgment? Because the ruler of this world is judged. And who is the ruler of this world? Satan, yeah. And uh, what does Satan being judged have to do with me being judged? Well, if God didn't let Satan off the hook when he sinned, what makes us think that he'll let us off the hook if we're one of Satan's homies or his followers? No. So the Holy Spirit's first work is to tell us that we have sinned, that we have not done the right thing, and that judgment is coming. But when we do believe in Christ, we will be rescued from condemnation in the judgment. If Jesus doesn't go away, the Comforter cannot come. The reason why it's better for Jesus to leave because he cannot be there physically to teach us about righteousness. However, with the Holy Spirit's present through the instructions of believer. We can improve and refine our character. It empowers us to be a witness to the gospel. And so, why does the Holy Spirit, um, what does the Holy Spirit does once you become a believer? Well, that's going to be in our next role. Um, Our second role is to confirm. But to confirm us of what? That we are a child of God. So let's look at Ephesians 1, verse 13 to 14. Ephesians 1, uh, 13 to 14, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also have, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until redemption of the purchased possession to the, to pray, to the praise of his glory. So you trusted in Christ after you heard the word of truth, then you believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. When a person hears the word, then you believe, um, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What function does the seal serve according to verse 14? Well, a guarantee, kind of like a down payment or uh, like a deposit of our inheritance. Now, let me give you like, a, like an, a, a, an example. Some of you who are like homeowners or who have recently bought a home, you may understand this a bit. Right? So you're in the process of uh, buying a home, and the market is really hot. So you're looking at like 5, 10, 15, even more. You know, poor buyers and, and poor, poor realtors. I, I can test for that. And uh, so you finally see this house you like, and, and you're like, oh, this is the one. I want this one. I want to move in here. So then you write an offer, and after that offer, you present it to the seller. And the seller, is like, and the seller they, they like the offer. It's a good one. Um, and so they accept it. But it doesn't just end from there. What you have to do is give a thing called an earnest money deposit, right? Um, which that earnest money deposit, depending how much you, you put, determines how serious you are to the seller. So once you put that uh, deposit and the seller accepts the contract, now the bank's reviewing everything from you and they're determining uh, if you are worthy and a risk uh, that they're willing to take for you to get to this home. So now everything is going well, and you receive something that's called like a clear to close. And it, it, it's after all that's set, um, uh, the date's usually around two to three, three weeks, whatever it is. And then you are able to get a home. However, you cannot go back on this, uh, your word because you made that deposit. But you can, but you, won't, you can't get that money back. And, but you can uh, check for other homes. 
Now, in the same way, the Holy Spirit is like a deposit for us, except God is wanting for our lives. You put down a down payment that was your guarantee to the seller that you were going to buy that house, or in that case, it's Jesus, right? He is preparing a place for you. That down payment is like the Holy Spirit. It's guaranteed that eventually you're going to close that deal. We can take our life back, but then we won't have that Holy Spirit if we decide to follow the world or do things according to what the world does. But of course, we can continually to go back to Jesus, as well as if we decide to look for another home. Um, we can still continue. So when you become a believer, now that spirit that has been outside of you comes inside of you and seals you and acts as your guarantee that when Jesus comes to seal the deal, you will make it. When, when we be become a believer, the Holy Spirit confirms it. Right? That's where we are saved by grace, faith. And, and this is the second thing that the Holy Spirit does. He confirms that heaven is our home and that at the second coming, when God closes the deal, we are going to make it. So from the time we were, we were uh, purchased at our converge, conversion until the time that God redeemed that purchase at the second coming. In that intervening time, the Holy Spirit functions as a guarantee that you are going to make it. This is, of course, dependent upon us continuing to walk in our decision. When we walk away from that decision, we need to come back to Jesus and uh, the process begin again. So let's go to the next verse, Romans 8, 14, 17. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cried out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heir with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So interestingly, has uh, anybody experienced with adoption or with an adopted child? Right? Some, I, I, that's it, yeah. So, so unfortunately, we don't get to choose who we are born to, um, who our parent is, what race. We don't, we don't get to pick that I'm going to be Italian or Jamaican anything like that, but we get to decide who our Heavenly Father is. In this case, God wants to adopt us, and it is our choice if we want to be by his side. When someone is adopted into a home, they don't know what exactly is expected. They just know at this stage that, is that I'm wanted, um, someone wants me, and someone desires me. I'm welcome here. And that's that part of what the Holy Spirit is doing, communicating that message that you are welcome here. Oops, let me put this in. <laughs> that you are welcome here, that you are wanted, that you were desired. Um, and that's the first part. The Holy Spirit just doesn't stop there. Now you are welcome into a home, and that's great. But when you don't know what's expected, it's not really fair for you to come into an environment where you're going to be held accountable for things that you don't know nothing about, for, for you to get punished for not doing what all the other kids, um, what they're not doing. And so what God does on the adopting isn't just acceptance, it's also a process of teaching you how to live a life like a child of God. Um, and, and this is true when you become a believer. The Spirit confirms you that you are going to heaven, and he confirms that you're a child of God. Now, not only that, he teaches you. So when you become a believer, he, he adopts you, you're his child, that's when he begins to teach you how to live his child. It's like when you, you have your, your kid, they don't just know the rules right away. You got to teach them, you know. Um, and so in that third, third stage, it's conform, Right? And that's that, that th third role that the Holy Spirit plays, to conform our lives according to God, um, according to how God wants us to live. And, and unfortunately, you see, you got many folks that have it uh, backward. Instead of the Spirit conforming uh, their lives according to God's will, they want the Spirit to conform according to their lifestyle. And, you know, they're like, no, I've got to take the Spirit with me into the club and all this. Man, you're you playing yourself if you think the Spirit is going to conform to that lifestyle. 
So you got this, the spirit is there to conform you into how God wants you to live. So Romans 8, 1 through 3. Um, <clears throat> so there is therefore no, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did, God did by sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh on accounts of his sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And let's continue from here, Romans 4, uh, 8 to 4 to 6. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, uh, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let's continue right here in verse 7 and 8. Because the, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's just hatred. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed it can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So is there a problem with the law of God? Of course not. But the problem with the law of God is ourself. What Paul is stating here is that we are uh, not capable of keeping the law apart from Christ. We need the Spirit of God to make that a reality in us. And so verse 3, the law cannot save you. Why? Because it was weakened through our flesh. Because our weakness, the law cannot save. So God sent Christ with a nature like ours and then condemned all of our sin in Jesus. And why did God uh, do all of this? for us? Well, in according to verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God sent Christ to die for us so that ultimately his righteous requirement, uh, the things he asked us to do in the law, could be fulfilled in our life. If we walk according to the spirit, in verse 6, the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, it was saying that the, the mindset of the flesh is enmity against God, which is hatred. For it is not subject to the law of God. Indeed, it cannot be. Um, so why is it that the mindset on the, the flesh is at uh, enmity with God, according to this verse? Because it's not subject to the law. You see, um, our like, settings are, are kind of like a factory setting. It's set to selfishness. We naturally have hatred toward God. Our own heart is wicked and deceitful. And only the spirit can change our mind. And so according to this text, there are two directions for your mind. Every human being, mind is on autopilot, stuck on the flesh until they believe the gospel and receive the spirit. When you believe the gospel and receive the spirit, God changes your mind from being um, set on the flesh to the spirit. If your mind is set to the flesh, you are an enemy of God. You are at war with God because you cannot obey his law or you choose not by, by living your own way. If your mindset is, is set to the spirit, you have life and peace. That was according to verse 6. Because the law is being fulfilled in your life. And in verse 4, the, the Holy Spirit will help us to, to please God. And so let's look at uh, Hebrews 10, 15 to 17. But the Holy Spirit also witnessed us after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, say the Lord, I will put my law into their heart and in their mind. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deed, I will remember no more. That's beautiful right there. Because uh, you got many Christians, many folks out there that are still stuck in the past about what their past sin and, and God is telling them, that he won't remember their sin no more. You know, I always say, man, the only thing you need to look at in the past is what Christ did for our life. You should be looking for the, the, the future, for that hope. You know, cut them off if they're just bringing back your past sins and all that. You're, the, the Bible tells you that God throws them in the bottom of the sea. You, you notice how a lot of people try to, it's, it's unreached, and a lot of people try to go in the bottom of the sea and they can't. Like the guys that, that try to do the Titanic the reason why God said he throws them into the bottom of the sea. It's unreachable. He forgets them no more. That's, praise the Lord. You go to the courthouse and they'll remember, they remember the speeding ticket I got like six years ago. 
and, and they'll bring it up. But God, he, he won't even, he, like he said, remember no more. So that, that verse we just read in Hebrew is quoting Jeremiah 31, which is an Old Testament reference to the new covenant. God is promising to enter into a new covenant relationship with his people. And what does he say? He will remember their sins no more and write their law on their minds and on, and, and on their hearts and their minds. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but this is exciting news. You know, it's just telling. Like, so many Christians, if only they hear about this news. They're, they're so stressed. They're living a life without relying on the power of Christ. And they're trying to do everything on their own effort and uh, with so much determination, hustle, and, and hard work on their own. And what ends up happening after all that effort, and maybe just like a few months you know, or later or a year, they end up uh, quitting their journey with God. But God is showing us that we don't have to walk in our own strength. He wants to walk right beside us so that we don't, we're not alone in this journey. <clears throat> so the Spirit convicts you of your sin. He confirms that, you're, that when you believe you are a child of God going to heaven, and then he begins to teach you how to live a life like a child of God by writing his law on your heart and on your mind, which equals a life transformation. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome our sinful nature. God is dealing with the root issue of our problem. Therefore, we can uh, grow into a likeness of Christ. <clears throat> like I said, if only Christ many Christians knew about this, they, they wouldn't feel so lonely or discouraged. You wouldn't have to try so hard to be perfect. You know, God does the, the, the heavy lifting. Now we look at uh, Galatians uh, 5, 19 to 21. Now the work of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, uh, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, uh, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the likes of which I tell you before. Just as I also told you in the past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are what the flesh produces. So anyone want to have these kind of fruit? Anyone? No. Nobody, right? It's not desirable. And sometimes we, we, we don't want it, but sometimes we end up taking it, you know? You know, and, and you know, like I served in the army. Like I, I know what it's like to be around people that, that you know, they, they have these fruits and, um, or your coworkers or, or neighbors. And sometimes, you know, they get so angry, they, they make the things, like, very uncomfortable, the surrounding area, and they, they're, like, slamming things, cursing. You know, most of them, of course, they don't want this, the, these type of fruit, um, because there's nothing enjoyable about it. But when you're led by the flesh, this is the type of fruit that is just produced. Now, let's, let's look at a, a better fruit. Um, Galatians 5, 22, 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are, who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Um, this is what the Spirit-filled life produces. Um, so which life do you prefer? The flesh or the Spirit? The Spirit? Okay. Yeah. Um, so being influenced in the, by the Holy Spirit produces uh, fruits that show us how we relate to God, uh, people, and ourselves. Um, the way you get that life is by getting the Spirit. And the way you get the Spirit is by believing in Jesus when you are convicted. Then you become a, uh, God's child and he teaches you how to live as his child. So when you feel convicted that you are uh, living a life that you should not have lived, believe in Jesus and you'll get the Spirit. And when you get the Spirit, he says, heaven is now your home. You are my child. And now let me teach you how to live like my child. Let me fill your life with my law, which lead to love, joy, gentleness, and goodness. This is perfect because whatever we are struggling with, take it to Jesus. We don't have to be perfect to go to Jesus. Our sinful nature is crucified at the cross. Um, your human nature doesn't change, but the desire change. So again, which fruit you prefer? It's obvious, the, the, the spirit. Now, 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 if you want to know which fruit you're pr pr producing, the best way to find out is, is when you're driving and someone caught you off in the road, 
Uh, who? That's when you know which food you're producing. Because let me tell you something, church. If you're out here throwing uh, unholy uh, gang signs to somebody with your fingers, or un, or you start speaking unholy tongues, you know you got some of the the, the fruit flesh. <laughs> that's how you know. Because you know it's hard, but you want that patient. Like eh, maybe he has somewhere somewhere to go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So John 14, 15, 18, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray, I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it is neither sees him nor, 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 nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphan. I will come to you. This is a great news again. There's a lot of exciting news. Jesus is not going to desert us. He will not leave us deserted. He is not saying, nope, come to me when you have less, less baggage or none of that. There's nothing that uh, too big that Jesus can't handle. And in the Greek, it's not imperative too. Jesus is not commanding here. If he were, he would be like a manipulator. It's a promise. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Why will I? Because Jesus will pray to the Father, and the Father will send you a helper. And the helper, which is the Spirit, will help you keep my commandments. Basically, it's saying people who love me keep the commandments because I give them the Spirit to help them to do it. Um, and helpers is uh, parakletos in Greek, which means uh, para, which is like side by side. And kletos, uh, it means to come. So parakletos means one who comes beside. Um, so the Holy Spirit will, will be walking alongside you and helping you along your journey. And, and I will ask the Father and he will send someone to come beside you. He will be with you. So if you love me, you will be doing my commandment because you won't be doing it on your own. There will be someone who comes alongside you and who will walk with you to help you accomplish this. Isn't that exciting, church? Amen. So let's look at uh, these three verses here. For you are sons of God uh, through faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.26. Uh, and because you are, are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. But the, spirit of, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, self-control. Against such, there is no law. <clears throat> like I said, some of us think that we have to get rid of uh, the things in our life to get the Spirit, but the, these verses are implying something quite different than that. What the verse is actually implying is that, that we need to believe in Jesus and from there, we receive the Holy Spirit, who in turn gives us the fruit of the Spirit, which is victory. There are many people who have a very discouraging Christian experience, and they're asking themselves, if they are really Christian, if I were really a Christian, would I be struggling with this? But the reality is this, they need to hear is the word, believe in the gospel, and trust that uh, this unleashes the Spirit in their life. You know, Praise the Lord when, when, when you are feeling this type of conviction, you know, when a, when a fellow uh, brother or sister, uh, Christian member, they're struggling, they say they, they smoke a cigarette or they did something they're not supposed to do, um, but yet they feel guilty. Praise the Lord for that because that's the Holy Spirit working in them and it's, a, um, it, it's them convicting them that the Spirit is telling them it's wrong. You know, now it's a problem when they're all nonchalant and it's just like just another day go by and they don't even feel guilty. Now, now you're, you're grieving the, the spirit. That's another the subject there. But now, but when you're feeling that conviction, the spirit is working with you. When you did something wrong and, and you feel bad, praise the Lord. You have the spirit. You know, God's not giving up on you. And so the idea is laid out in John chapter 3. When Jesus talks with uh, Nicodemus, John 3, Jesus tells us, um, Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you want to go to heaven, you need to be born again. He asks, how can a man enter the womb a second time? So Jesus is basically saying, no, you need to be born of water and of the spirit. Nicodemus asks, how can these things be? 
That's the critical point of this chapter. Jesus' answer is, if I be lifted up like Moses did with the serpent, whoever believes in me can have everlasting life because I have to die and you have to believe. Sounds like the point we mentioned earlier. Um, in order for you to be born of the Spirit, I have to die and you have to believe it. So when the gospel is preached and people believe it, it unleashes the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. And that's, of course, dying to our old self, our old lifestyle, and being renewed through Christ. Um, let's look at John 15, 1 through 3. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, which is like literally lift up, not just discarding it. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the world which I have spoken to you. Let's continue. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he, he is cast out as branches and wither, and they gather them and throw them into the fire where they are burned. So most people think that abiding in Christ is bearing fruit. So if I'm not bearing fruit, I'm, not, I'm going to the fire. But the phrase take away means to lift up. When a vine isn't bearing fruit, they elevate it and help it to bear fruit. Um, and that's what's being said here. The branches that he casts out, on the other hand, are the ones that don't abide in him. Um, the point is that he takes responsibility of, for our fruit bearing. We don't need to uh, focus on bearing fruit. What we need to do is focus on abiding in Jesus. And he enables us to uh, bear uh, the fruit. Like, I, I, right here... Yeah, praise the Lord. I, I like this here because, like I said, unfortunately there's many Christians um, and many people, you know, that believe that the reverse, that they have to bear fruit themselves instead of focusing on Jesus. And isn't that stressful? Yeah, it is. Very stressful. I mean, you know, if you got to do that yourself, I mean, God's standard is high. But thankfully, we have Jesus who lived the life we couldn't um, live and offers his righteousness to us. When we struggle, we will be lifted up in him. So sometimes we got to realize that our struggle is growth through Christ. Sometimes we go through a lot of struggle, but the spirit is still working in us. And God is going to lift us up to help us bear fruit. Not the other way around. Not the, I got to push myself harder than last time. You know, Romans 5, 8, 10, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinner, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his, great, great, by his life. So Jesus' death cancels our debt. <clears throat> Jesus' life gives us our fitness to heaven. If all I had um, was the death of Jesus, I would have no hope for eternal life. My past debt will be clear with no hope of living a victorious life going forward. So God does... So God does desire us to live a life that is free from sin. He does intend for us to overcome. If he didn't, why did he, just send, why did, why did he send Jesus to suffer and overcome, to die and rise again? Right? If that wasn't the case, then Jesus could have said, I'm here in the altar, just sacrifice me. That's it. But no, he came to suffer and die for our sins. And uh, he has provided this means necessary to overcome by sending Jesus to live a perfect life that we have not led and empowering us um, to live Christ's life through, the Holy, through, through his spirit. Now I'm going to read uh, Hebrews 4, 14 and 16. I didn't put it here, so I got um, read it out of my Bible. And it says that seeing Hebrews 4, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, if those who want to follow along. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through in heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. 
Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Wow, praise the Lord. Now, the, the Hebrews 2.18, I just wanted to read. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Praise the Lord. Are you, in, uh, are you alone in this journey? No, man. This right here, the Bible tells you, Jesus suffered away so that we can, that he can relate to us and that there is victory for what we are suffering. He's been at all points tempted, um, yet without sin. And he can give us that victorious life. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to read this uh, from this uh, couple, uh, a passage from this book. Um, it's talking about the, the Holy Spirit radical. Um, I would just check it out when, if you like, but uh, I'll read a, a couple slides. So if then, if you then, who are evil, know how to give a good gift to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11. He is saying that when we pray for the Father's provision, he will find that his provision is good. And the more he provides for us, the more we will trust him as our Father. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give a good gift to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gift to those who ask him? That's in Matthew 7. And if you notice there's a difference there at the end. But why does Luke 11 refer to the Father giving the Holy Spirit? To be honest with you, I used to think, what if I wasn't asking for the Holy Spirit? What if I was asking for something else? Why does Jesus say the Father gives the Holy Spirit in response to our prayer? The answer to this question uncovers the beauty of the Spirit of God in our lives. Think about it this way. Maybe you're going through a struggle in your life, a tragedy strikes you, or someone close to you, and you are hurting. So you go to God in prayer, and you ask him to comfort you. You realize what God does? He doesn't give you uh, comfort. Instead, he gives you the Holy Spirit, who is called the Comforter. The Holy Spirit literally comes to dwell in you and puts the very comfort, Christ, inside you as you walk through your pain. So, uh, suppose another time uh, you are making a big decision in your life, and you need help. You have a couple of different options before you and you need guidance to decide which way is the best. So you ask God for help. But he doesn't answer with guidance. Instead, he answers by sending the Holy Spirit, who is our God. God sends the helper who will live in you and not only tell you what decision to make, but also enable you to make that decision. Yet another time you need discernment, and God gives you the spirit of wisdom. At another time, you need strength, and God gives you the spirit of power. Still, other times you ask God for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and he gives, you the, he gives you the spirit who makes all these things a reality in your life. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, the, help, the helper, the guide, the very presence of, of God living in you. This is the promise of God in prayer. We ask God for gift in prayer and he gives us the giver. We ask God to, for supply, and he gives us the source. We ask God for money, and he doesn't give us cash. Instead, so to speak, he gives us the bank. When you really contemplate it, it seems bold, doesn't it, to go to God and say, God, I know you're busy you know, running the universe and keeping all creation alive, but I have this problem in my life, and God, I don't really want comfort for the moment. I don't really want guidance for the moment. Would you, would you just come down live in me, and walk through, walk through this for me, it, isn't it pushing the envelope to ask God of the, the universe to come down and take residence in you and me? What Jesus is saying, though, is that God, our Father, delights in this. He delights giving himself, giving us himself. He puts his very power in us so that we, so that we might have all we need to accomplish his purpose in this world. Let's go to our, our, our final verse here. And I am certain, Philippians 1, 6, and I am certain that God, who begins the good work within you, will continue to work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So God, who begins a work in, in us, will continue to work until it is finally finished. I don't know about you, but I'm not like a, like a finisher, but we definitely need finishers in this world. And God has stated a work before you were born, and he's going to finish before he returns. We should never feel alone in this journey. God is promising you to live within your heart. 
the Spirit has come, they convict the, that they convicted the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so we are not, we're not even looking for God at, at uh, the Spirit. The, the, we're not looking for God, but this Spirit comes looking for us. But when, but you love that God has a way for you to make it, make it. So the first role of the, the ministry of the Spirit is that he's convicting the world, even unbelievers, of their unbelief. And he's pointing them to Jesus who died for the wrongdoing and, and to believe in Jesus. And not only that, like he suffered as well. And the next phrase of the Holy Spirit is that he declares you righteous. You are currently a child of God. When you believe in Jesus and from that, that moment you say yes to Jesus until the second coming of Christ, assuming that you keep walking with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is testifying, confirming, this is my son, this is my daughter, they belong here. It's a statement of good faith that they will be in heaven, um, um, they will be in heaven, that Jesus will bring them home as soon as they, as, as soon, as soon as they keep walking with Jesus. And the third phrase is the Holy Spirit is to confirm, right? Um, to mold you into the image of Christ. Ain't that a blessing, guys? You guys alone in this journey? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to uh, praise the Lord. We got Ramon here. Uh, my good friend. I call him Ramon Santos sometimes. <laughs> it's like the Santos means saint in Spanish. But he's going to be sharing the music. I want you guys to think about your journey with God and pray to God uh, what's on your mind, you know. God's been through, uh, you know, Jesus knows exactly what you're suffering through. He knows what you're going through. Uh, he knows that the lifestyle is not easy. But God is there to help you. Remember Paracletos, that right? comes by side. So, Ramon. good work in you. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He is faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. If the struggle you're facing is slowly replacing your hope with despair, oh, the struggle is long and you're losing your song in the night but you can be sure that the lord has his hand on you safe and secure he will never abandon you you are his treasure and he finds his pleasure in you don't forget it Akel. Quien la buena obra empezó, aquel quien la buena obra empezó, será fiel en completarla. He is faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you he who began a good work in you jesus who began a good work in you faithful to complete it yes he is faithful to complete it Christ who started the work will be faithful to complete it 
in you in you being confident of this very thing that he will begin a good work and you will be faithful to complete it to the end when our Lord Jesus comes for us thank you Lord Jesus thank you for the work you do for us amen Praise the Lord alone. Thank you for sharing that uh, message. Um, hey, he surprised me there with uh, singing in Spanish. Uh, that, that definitely, I think I need the, the, the subtitles. <laughs> but, you know, that he will begin a good work, uh, continue to work until he's finally finished. And I wanted to share this type of uh, analogy, you know, and you know, everybody who is buying a home, they want the home to be perfect, fully furnished, remodeled, very nice inside. So many eyes are in that particular home. That's the, the, the most competition. Ain't that right, Brenda? Yeah, as you can tell you too. Yet there is only a few people that can look at a home that is very distressed, and they don't look at the home for what it is, but for what it can be. And God looks at you the same way. He doesn't look at you for what you have done, what's your past, who you are. He sees the potential in each and every one of you for, who, uh, for what you can be. So it doesn't matter how much of an upper fixer you are, or how much distress your life uh, is, or how much baggage or dead weight you're carrying. Uh, there's nothing that the Holy Spirit can't take a hold of. You don't have to walk uh, alone in this journey. God doesn't wait for you. He looks for you. Um, the Holy Spirit is testifying you that you are a child of God. The Spirit will conform you us so that we can have uh, Christ's righteousness. He declares you righteous while you are being made righteous. So don't be afraid to go to God. Um, um, conviction is not condemning you. Um, so what will keep you from allowing Christ to send the Spirit to come alongside you and help you to live a life as God's son and daughter? And I wanted to close with a benediction, uh, Galatians 2.20. Uh, Galatians 2.20. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I'm going to pray and uh, you're dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just want to praise you and, and thank you for everything you have done. Lord, we're just thankful that, that uh, you know, we don't have to do this alone, Lord. We're thankful that we have a God who cares for us. We're thankful that we have a God who wants to abide in us, live in us, um, and walk alongside us. We're thankful, Lord. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. The world wants us to do things that, that, uh, that just leads to death, uh, sadness, and... and destruction, Lord, but we want to lead a life of peace and, uh, and, and happiness, Lord. Um, we're thankful, Lord. Um, please be with each and one of us, Lord. If we're struggling, Lord, um, help us, as you say, Lord, not, uh, to lift us up, Lord, to uh, help us to bear fruit. Um, help us each day, Lord. I know it's a process, and it, it, it takes time, and we're thankful that, that, that you're, you're a finisher, Lord, that you, you're going to make sure that the job is done, Lord. And um, Father, we just ask that you forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I was asked to just make a brief announcement here. Um, that the choir rehearsal for the children is immediately following service today.